Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome. This is Viathan here, and today we're going to do some old-time radio shows that are going to uh, put some spook into you, put some scare into you, I should say. So uh, turn out your lights, turn them out. Let's make sure it's nice and dark so you get the right ambience here, for we are going to have ourselves some fun ghost tales tonight. The first episode is titled Ghost Talk. And it was aired in 1975 on CBS Old Time Radio, uh, CBS Old Time Radio Theater, or I'm sorry, CBS Old Time Radio Mystery Theater. Um, the episode is currently in the public domain, and is a great tale. It's about a person who's di- died, and his wife is mourning him, and because his wife is constantly in mourning and constantly saying, "Oh my dear, oh my dear," and calling to him. He cannot enjoy his afterlife. Instead, he has to haunt and visit her. And that is just driving him nuts. Now, just so you know, to haunt means to frequent, to visit. So this one is quite an interesting tale and quite an interesting take on the afterlife. I think think it's kind of what some people might vision an afterlife as being. Um, The second tale is called A Coffin for the Devil. It also aired in 1975, and it involves um, also on CBS Radio Mystery Theater, also currently in the public domain. And this one involves E.G. Marshall, the the narrator for CBS Radio Mystery Theater. He um, is invited, along with some specialists, to a friend's house. Um, The friend has a uh, special coffin and a special note from his ancestor it's passed down from history to history and they try to figure out what the meaning is behind this it's a great tale great story lots of fun a little spooky um, especially if you had if you just close your eyes and just picture the scenery these two episodes would make for an amazing animation if done properly an amazing show and i hope uh, cbs radio mystery theater or i'm sorry cbs itself would start some kind of animation on the, on all these old CBS Radio Mystery Theater shows. There's about 1,587 of them made or more. Okay, so without further ado, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. Uh, feel free to send me an email back. Please subscribe t- um, if you listen to this on YouTube. Otherwise, uh, shoot me a private message or uh, send me an email to viathan75, that's V-I-A-T-H-I-N, 75, at gmail.com. Thank you all. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts. And I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Yes, Melba. It is I. Oh, oh, Paul. Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it, All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy? Where... Where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. Our mystery drama, Ghost Talk, 
was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. Yes, ghosts haunt places. Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape, and it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will he give up haunting altogether, or will he do what we have done? Adjust. Melba? You have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all... I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? all gone. Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. Now I'm all alone. No, I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and, and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but I'm, what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. Oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. Twenty-two years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over... Paul isn't really dead, as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. How goes it, Paul? Well, hello. It's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. <laughs> you never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Uh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Yeah, why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered, apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know, from bitter personal experience... My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died, till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Well, forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable but as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on earth was over. Well, I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well and quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough... I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? Well, the way it's always done. 
As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Oh, all right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. <laughs> I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I, I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. Bruce. Oh, Bruce. That you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far... This is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything. Since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, uh, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba. Your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine, of hers, ours, Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's, it, it's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. <gasps> There she goes again, hear her? Oh, Paul, dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what me. about this Leonard Whipple? Well, he's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean... She was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. <gasps> well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him. Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in eons. I never have. Uh, sir? Sir, please? Hmm? No. Oh, yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Mm. There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. Is she here? Oh, no. She's with the living. On Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I, I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so... Theatrical. Huh? But if it'll make her feel better? Mm, I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? Well, you're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. <laughs> However, like everyone else, I keep trying. Now, if I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain. You'll both excuse me? 
He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Dear Paul. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Actually, not many of us do it. It's, it's, it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way. Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that. I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable. Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. No, we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, can't I just appear in some simple, straightforward way? Just say, here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. Well, I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh? Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. And don't stay too long. And above all, don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? Mm. You'll find out, my friend. You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father, speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed, no. And certainly not depressing, I'll return shortly with Act Two. Our moribund hero, Paul, has decided to return to Earth as a ghost and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor... And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own 10th floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm -hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his. His after-dinner coffee in the morning. Cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. You don't say. That's the English way, you know. Milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes! Well, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I, I wanted to show you something fascinating... Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't... Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bars. Some other time. I, I've i really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk away with me? In the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Yeah, well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office. Good night, Melba. 
Thanks for dinner. Thank you for bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it, it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need you, Paul. Melba. Oh, I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said, I'm here. Paul? Yes. Me. Paul. But, but, where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see. I, I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Paul. Can that be you? It is. I. Really, you? Well, fairly, really. Everything considered as real as I can get. Oh, I, I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered. Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me, are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it... it doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well, naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Well, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was. Before I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey, I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well, you were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There'll never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity... And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh, perhaps, but even like this. It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. <laughs> Hello, Irene. Me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living room. All right, then. He's ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, it, he didn't say too much. I, I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great big noise, a, a crash sort of... No, not like thunder, more like, like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. So, 
Sir. Oh, oh sir, may I speak with you? Mm-hmm. No. Oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Uh, sir, uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. I have all the time there is. Well, I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir, may, Oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Uh, what about? I... I've been back to the Earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Hmm. I wonder if I was right about that. These Earth trips can be very upsetting. Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh. Uh, oh, oh, yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that... That happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression... Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul, no more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Oh, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Oh, why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they want me to do everything. But it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Hmm. Tell you what, why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes, talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that poor star. <laughs> Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now, you listen, Paul. Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Mel says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever till she joins me here, and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me, and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment... And, and, Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. It didn't used to be, but now... You, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well, I did. For a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just... just brush her off. My, my. You do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but sometimes... Look, there's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? 
to, to Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot. How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? Helen of Troy, they call her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... Marriages are made in heaven, so it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. Melba was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You've definitely burned yourself out, little one. Oh, too bad. Sir? Oh, sir. Now, look, Paul, this dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, sir... I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. Get married? He says the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. Well, if you could give me a little advice... I uh... gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is uh, what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence, a little simple sense. Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You, you're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh. <sighs> However, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, don't say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked... Now, Paul, I really must go to tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene, it's me. Oh, just sitting around. Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... Well, there's a beautiful moon out tonight. And I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? 
Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now. It scared me to death. Well, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? There's that, that whistling sound. Can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Or maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? <gasps> what? There goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight just stopped shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene, oh, are you there? Oh, are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. For no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. The more than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh my goodness. Something just ran through the room. How do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Irene, there's something here in the kitchen. It's, it's laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be Paul, because... Because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, Here I am, Melba, dear. It couldn't be Paul. Here I am, Melba, dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba, dear. Melba, I'm here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You, you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things, and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh, don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just it. And I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean to tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. I mean, Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? If you'd let him. Well, Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. No. My lips are sealed. It's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who, too? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she's very pretty. Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How 
Would he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. No, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. Thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. It's very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to... I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I... I could see you to the door. No. Let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh. He's gone. He just disappeared. Well, that's the way with ghosts. Oh. Who needs ghosts, anyway? With all their comings and goings. And the way they talk. Who can understand them? Hello, Irene? Irene... You are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. Bruce. Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here, we do as we choose. He told you that. How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type... But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so free and sort of uninhibited, so peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go. On account of me, you didn't go? Well, I must say, Leonard... Oh, I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like, I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. Tomorrow, I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard, I was thinking, as long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted? And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Ah, oh, good. We'll come early, and we'll have a martini first. Well, good for Melba. Good for Leonard. And good for Bruce. And for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. You do realize, don't you, that the story I've just brought you was all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, 
you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, well, for one thing, are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Peterson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying? Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said... Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where, Where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise... The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family, and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... <clears throat> I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, oh, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's, it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, what's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in, sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. 
We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For, for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's $50. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the $50 enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. Now, the shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's, it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Right. Hinges. You see them here on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... but why? I mean, the drawing is... it's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now leave enough room for y your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. Bill! Bill! Are you in there? Just a minute. I'm opening the door. Lucy! What are you doing here? Are you all right? Is he still here? What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened. All the way over here, I was just worried about you and... And, and scared, but... But I came anyway, and now... I'm... Oh, Bill, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I... don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but... I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will we live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand? I don't want hands touching me. But have been touching death all day. <sighs> all right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Well, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not, but I heard it from the barber. Some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. Looks something like a carrying case for a, a, a bass fiddle. Yes, sir. It looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? <sighs> yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh... 
I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset, she's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Now, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't, but Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven. Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people, and I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I've thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had in I've his voice. I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. That coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. A, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay $50? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here. I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful, but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Matt, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, that won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? 
Someone tampered with the coffin, and we don't know who. We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door. Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there... There's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, that's it, in the corner. Mm -hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. Well, the make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir, it's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it off. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers, if there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... I thank you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He he lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, okay. I'll, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that, that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry. How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes. Around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. The locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is, where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Well, he must have gone in. <clears throat> Gate's locked. Uh, well, I have my key. You, you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on, come on. Uh, no, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I, I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who can lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg Don't of close you. Close the gate. I beg of you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. Right. At this point, Bill Spindle stopped reading and put down the letter. 
My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried, and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. (laughs) Don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up. Wake uh, up, man. Well, I, well, Bill, Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed, and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. <laughs> Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh. It's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right... What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. 
The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music, and I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside, the lid slammed shut and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. We can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, do we really have to go on? It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. Yeah, it's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? Uh, we'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right. All right. I'll come with you. Good Lord. There he is, lying across that coffin. And, and so still. Is he... Is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation. But I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with this strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather, but he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling I me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. 
Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass, a talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music and my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I'd go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the prince of darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering... You'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time, when suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because... Not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined. Joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? <laughs> There's one thing I know, darling... I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestor's girl, Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. But why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindles family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, 
I'm stumped. <laughs> it's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, the date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. All right. I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if you forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy, I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see, a really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely, why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here, I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Ah, uh -huh. then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in 10 20 and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place? Remember... Our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but... That would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and, and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one, how in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. <laughs> you mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin. What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jay. Are you not going to try and tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head? Well, it's, it's possible. Maybe, I don't but... believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me. Let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, it all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. All right. Ah, dear. <laughs> it's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. <gasps> right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. <sighs> That's got it now. <sighs> now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I, 
I can't. <gasps> you got it. You got it. Uh, Jerry was right. It's a secret yes. compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money. A twenty dollar bill. Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs. And he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Polan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. WCCO Radio, you Las Vegas for three days and three nights. Well, everyone, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed these two stories. Um, I plan on having uh, many stories uh, uploaded. I'm starting June 6th. I will start having uh, what we call Manic Monday, where we're just going to have uh, old-time radio shows that have uh, fun themes to them, maybe some, uh, uh, definitely some comedy, maybe a monster show, maybe a uh, little bit of everything mystery it'll be some suspense shows there'll be some thrillers some mysteries some detective stories some um fun happy stuff um comedies and well you name it there's all kinds of inter interesting old-time radio shows out there from the uh 40s all the way up to the early 80s um on tuesdays we're gonna have terror tuesdays so it's gonna be all horror stories and um, some thrillers and a lot of macabre, but very entertaining. Um, good for all ages. Hopefully, if you don't get too scared too easily. If you do, I'm going to make sure to put a warning out, um, especially for the Lights Out episodes. Those tend to be the most spookiest. Um, on Wednesdays, there will be westerns, all kinds of western shows. Thursdays will be... Uh, I think we'll do uh, suspense and thrillers on Thursdays. Thrilling Thursday. Freaky Friday. Lots of monsters. Lots of uh, action shows. Maybe some crime dramas. And then on Saturday, Satrical Saturday, will be all comedy shows. Um, Sunday, we'll be doing um, Super Sundays. Green Hornet. Uh, ba the old-time Batman radio shows. The old-time Superman shows. Uh, there are a whole bunch of ones that are all in the public domain that could be used like Red Rider and stuff. So um, please tune in. Um, this will be up on on YouTube under CB Gable. Um, if you have any questions, this will also be on, on Twitch all under the name Viathan, V-I-A-T-H-I-N, and that's V as in victory. Uh, if you want to reach out, please do so. Uh, email Viathan, V-I-A-T-H-I-N, 75 at gmail.com post a like subscribe um i'm also going to be doing some of my own poetry reading as well as my own horror stories and short stories um and i hope to eventually be able to get this so where instead of seeing different colors on the screen um that move around to the voices 
I'm hoping to be able to start getting some background, maybe some images, maybe if somebody out there is good at animation, maybe we can work together to animate uh, introductions and exits and um, maybe even animate some of the shows. Uh, reach out to me. I'd be glad to work with you. I don't have any money, but uh, we can definitely work something out, hopefully. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Take care, and thank you for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe if you get a chance, and send me a message. I'd like to hear your thoughts.